Last week on Interman Radio, we talked about the only change that actually works, and that's changing from the inside out. This week, we're going to look at exactly how we go about doing that. What's the first step? What's the second step? We talked about Moses and how Moses saw the glory of God at the top of Mount Sinai, and it was a miraculous transformation. His face was on fire. We don't want to start our faces on fire, but we do want the same kind of miraculous change that Moses received, but we want it in character. And so this week, that's precisely what we're going to do. Welcome to Interman Radio, where we accomplish more than we thought we could through God's power working in us. So let's drop the excuses, pick up our Bibles, and prepare to win. All right, Mark, last time we talked about the process of seeing Christ dwell in us. When we look at Christ and we're being transformed into his image, it's a lot like what happened to Moses physically, only we're talking spiritually in our lives, the process of being transformed into his character. Right. That sounds easy. Yeah. Well, just look at God and it'll take care of the problem. Okay. Yeah. So exactly how do I do that? And James chapter 1, verse 23 talks about how we see in a mirror. You know, the scriptures are a mirror, and mirrors reflect the people who look into them. You know, if somebody who's not a Christian looks into the scriptures, they're going to see Christ, but it's also going to point out to them their lack of Christ. It's going to point out their lack of character. When somebody's a Christian and they look into the mirror of the New Testament, what they ought to see is that the Spirit of Christ, which hasn't changed, the Spirit of Christ is the same Spirit that dwells in you and I. Mm-hmm. So, and that's, that's a huge deal when guys get that through their mind. Romans chapter 8 in verses 9 through 11 talks about how the Spirit of Christ is the Spirit that dwells in us. 2 Timothy 1 7 says we've received His Spirit. Not one of, of uh, timidity, but one of power and love and discipline. That's His Spirit. But He says we've received it. So now that's our Spirit. And then 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4 says, We've become partakers of his nature. Well, it's his nature, but we are now partakers of it. Mm-hmm. That's a big deal. Yes. Let's set this up a little bit because we want to put this into some practical application, right? Okay. Okay. So let's, uh, let's take a guy. We'll call him Andy. All right, Andy. Okay. Andy can't control his tongue. Uh-oh. He swears under his breath. Uh, He curses at oncoming traffic. (laughs) And when he's alone, he finds himself going off on political tirades or whatever. (laughs) Or whatever. Whatever. Right. Or hypothetical Andy. Yeah, hypothetical Andy. None of us. (laughs) Anyway, okay. (laughs) But when he's at home, Andy's just, he's he's Joe Joe Christian and, and, you know, kids are the words we use. Trying to to do right. Yeah, okay. Okay. But finally, it pops out, Uh-oh. and his kids hear him. You keep using the word. I do not think it means what you think it means. Mm. And somebody asks, they say, Daddy, what did you just say? <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Ah. <laughs> hmm, Andy has a choice. So you can see the, the shoulder angel on one side and the shoulder double right. on the other side talking to him. Uh-huh. Okay, uh-huh. he's got a choice. Go clean your room. <laughs> <laughs> Taking Andy's scenario, we can use that to identify the process of putting this transformation into practice. Let's start with Andy. Yeah. What's the first step for Andy? Well, sometimes it takes moments like this to kind of shake us up a little bit Mm -hmm. because, it, it, frankly, it's really easy to be a little self-deceiving and to say, you know, I've got this Christianity thing pretty well under control. And it takes a moment like this. That's why Jesus said men are going to be judged by every careless word that they speak, Mm -hmm. not their careful words. Right. So it takes a moment like this to really show us, hey, this is really where we're at. So if we have a blow up, if this happens, if that happens, guys, gal, that's an important moment for you to stop and say, okay, hold the phone. This is an issue and I got to fix it. And what we want to do today is talk about how do we fix it? So really the first step is to be honest and admit that we did something wrong and that there is something that needs to be overcome. There's something we need to change. The, the beginning point for this process is to be able to take a really honest look at ourselves and straight up and say, okay, what's the deal? What's the deal? What needs to get fixed? And, and to be upfront about it and open and honest with ourselves and open and honest with God. 
in uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 6, he says, If we say we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves, the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we haven't sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. John says, listen, number one lesson here is you got to be honest about stuff. Mm -hmm. So if it's a sin, then boys and girls, we got to be honest about that. We have to say, you know what, I've, I've got an issue here. I've, I got to solve this. And I'm going to need some help to get that done. That's number one. If we don't get past step one and say, I have a problem, I've got an issue that needs to be resolved, there's a weakness in my character, we don't, we don't make any progress. We have, to, we have to begin there. Those are valuable things for us. When we, when we do something stupid, that's a valuable opportunity for us to get some insight into what's really in the inner man. But let's be honest about it. Let's take it on the chin. And let's fix it. Uh, what's the attitude that a person should have when they're going about this? Because it's easy if we identify something in ourselves that's wrong. It's easy to to wallow in that. You know, we can be honest, but we can also self pity yeah. as well. <laughs> oh, you know, I've never been able to overcome this, and I, well, there I go again. The old, the same old, same. Old, oh man, you know. And then we can complain to our wives and try to get them on our side, and we're being honest, but we're really kind of using the situation. Right. For, and if she loves you, she's going to say, "Get over yourself." Yeah. And and go take care of it. You yeah. know, be, yeah. be a big boy and uh, and go take care of it. What we want to do is we're going to kind of do this the same way that we would uh, that we would self um, medicate. Uh, what's the word? Not <laughs> medicate. No, uh, I can't remember. Self diagnose. Oh, That's what we're going to do. Self diagnose. Wow. Pop psych. We'll medicate later. It's all your daddy's. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna self diagnose here. If there's an issue, first thing we got to understand if the what we see that failure is the symptom of a deeper problem. Okay, and Western medicine approaches health in an, in an in a strange way compared to the rest of the world. We, we try and treat the symptoms oftentimes, and we don't really deal with the source of the problem. That Your headache is not the result of a deficiency in your aspirin intake. It's not? No, I'm sorry, no. Oh. <clears throat> We're treating the symptom, and what we need to do is treat the problem. If if somebody curses at his son, or if some, you know, if if somebody blows up at the office, or whatever is the whatever is the issue, that's a symptom of a deeper problem. And what we want to do is we want to find what's the thing I'm lacking. You know, for instance, scurvy is a disease, but it's really caused by a deficiency of vitamin C. So what we want to do is we want to look at the symptom, but we want to find what is it that I'm lacking. There's a part of Christ's character that I'm deficient in if I'm behaving badly. So what we want to do is we want to look at some of those characteristics. And the real convenient spot for this is in Galatians chapter 5, where in verses 19 through 21, Paul outlines the deeds of the flesh for us, right? He says, the deeds of the flesh are evident. Well, they're symptomatic. Those are the things that we see. They are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorceries, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envyings, drunkenness, carousings, and things like these. That covers the rest. Yeah, in case I missed one. Of which I forewarn you as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. He said those are the symptoms. He said those are the deeds of the flesh that are evident. But that's not the problem. That's the symptom. Now, in verse 22 and 23, he outlines... What are the fruits of the Spirit, which are, as you know, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Now, if somebody has love, joy, peace, patience, and so on, perfectly, the things in verses 19 through 21 will automatically resolve themselves. Now, I didn't make that up. He said that in verse 16. I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. See, if, if we're focused on doing the one thing, if we're putting in the character of Christ, if we've appropriated Christ's character, the deeds of the flesh are largely going to take care of themselves. Wait, so, so the first step, backing up, is to be honest when we're faced with that moment of truth. Yes. And to be truthful. So the second is to identify a character quality of Christ that we're lacking. And using Galatians is a great way to do that because he compares and contrasts 
uh, the character qualities of Christ, the fruits of the Spirit, with the deeds of the flesh. Right. So the deeds of the flesh are symptoms that we would see in our life if exactly. we don't have the character qualities that are listed as fruits of the Spirit. You, you got it. That's okay. exactly right. So <clears throat> the next thing that, that we want to do is we want to focus then on what's the character, what, where's the, what's the element of the character of Christ that I'm lacking in? What do I need to have that's going to take care of that problem? So in the case of our hypothetical Bob here, and, and please, Andy. Andy, Andy, hypothetical Andy. In his case, what's his issue? Mm, outbursts of anger is uh, Galatians 5.20 is on that list. Okay, why are you angry? Mm. Is it because, and let's just use the ones in verses 22 and 23. Is it because, I, am I angry because I lack love? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Joy? What mm-hmm. about peace? Somebody may be without peace, and the result is outbursts of anger. How about patience? Patience, yeah. Kindness? Some of these are going to overlap. But guys, what we want to do is we want to, as as carefully as possible, try and identify, you know what? I think that's my deal right there. You know, I think it's I think it's patience. I just, it feels like I'm a rubber band and I get tighter and tighter and tighter until I snap. And if I could just chill out and if I could just let people, it's not a big deal and relax. Maybe that's it. Maybe it's maybe it's a joy. You know, maybe the guy's it's, it's envious because this guy he perceives as having more than him or whatever, and so he he's he releases that in an outburst of anger. Maybe it's a lack of joy. Maybe it's a lack of self control. Maybe it's an maybe it's a lack of kindness. But you got to sort that out. So you got to sit down, you and the Bible, and say, okay, which one of these is it? Which one am I? deficient in. If I had this, if I had this piece of Christ's character, that would really help me overcome this symptom that I'm facing. Does that make sense? It does. Okay, so in how we do that, looking at Christ and how he acted might be a great tool for identifying that. So if if we can go and look at Christ's actions on earth and and the more we dig and look at, at different situations that he was put in, and see how he responded, that might actually help us identify those, right? That is step three. That That is the segment where we are actually going to take that thing, that character of Christ, but we're going to diligently look at it. So this sounds a little weird, but let's say somebody has a trouble lying, all right? People, they, they lie. Okay, so what does he need? He needs honesty. Lying is the symptom. Honesty is the cure. This is a simple version, but it's just easy for people to get a handle on. So honesty is the cure. So I love the way that Paul describes this in Ephesians chapter 4. It's such a good illustration of using the principle and uh, and making the change. In Ephesians and chapter 4, he says in verse, uh, verse mm, let's pick it up in verse 25. He says, therefore laying aside falsehood. Speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Well, what is it that's going to cause somebody to realize they got a problem with lying? Generally, when they get caught. Yeah. One, right? They go, oh, you know what? I might have an issue there. Right. Okay, so take a good look if that's the issue. Well, our job is to lay aside the falsehood. How do we do that? Speak the truth. truth. I can't say I'm just not going to lie anymore. No more lies for me. Okay. No, I've got to. I've got to focus on the characteristic I'm missing, which is truth. I am a truthful man. And where do I see in Jesus that He's truthful? That's what we want to do now. Is we want to isolate the instance where we can see honesty in flesh and blood, where we can see Jesus demonstrate that particular quality. Okay. So. You just said, instead of focusing on not telling a lie, we're going to focus on speaking truth. Right. So the answer is is to speak truth to one another. But if I'm what? hearing that for the first time, I'm thinking, wait a minute, Mark. What you just said is I'm going to willpower my way to speaking truth. I'm just going to change it. It's like that cigarette example. Right. I'm just going to stop. I'm just not going to smoke anymore. I'm just going to – okay. But the difference here between just saying I'm going to tell the truth and I'm going to willpower my way to it. The difference between that and what we're talking about, which is the process of cleaning the inside, changing mm-hmm. the inside, is that it's it's a decision. Yes, I'm going to tell the truth. I'm going to speak truth. But how I'm going right. to learn to do that 
is I'm going to look into Christ's character where he practices yes. speaking the truth. And I'm going to look at that a certain way and study it. And in the process, it becomes part of my character. That's exactly it. <clears throat> so, yes, our willpower is involved in making the decision. But what happens next is God's deal. What happens next is how God deals with us. So our job is is um, in verse 22, in reference to your former manner of life, lay aside the old self. Okay, well, that that's yeah. going to take some personal responsibility, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. And you be renewed. That's passive tense. That's happening to us hmm. in the spirit of your mind. And put on the new self. So there's some personal responsibility there which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. So the method that we employ to make those changes is radically different than duct tape. Yes, and he gives us the roadmap in Ephesians 4, which you just read. That's it. That's the roadmap. That's it. So where can I find an example in Jesus' life where Jesus speaks truth. Well, all the time. <laughs> yeah, like uh, the there's got to be, I'm sure there's one. But maybe there's an example where he would have been tempted to lie, but he spoke the truth anyway. Sure. There's places where he speaks the truth to his family. In Mark's gospel, uh, you know, his mother and his brothers come to get him. Jesus said, who is my mother and my brothers? Those who do the will of my father. Ooh. That, that'd be truthful to mm-hmm. family. If your struggle is telling truth to family, that might be a place where you'd want to spend some time. If it's truth to power, Jesus Th- is not afraid to speak truth to power. To the Pharisees and the, the Jewish leaders of his day. Yeah. He said, you're slaves of sin in John chapter 8. They said, no, we're not. Mm-hmm. Jesus didn't back down from that. If it's speaking truth to those who are hurting, Jesus doesn't back down from that either. The woman at the well in John chapter 4. He says, uh, go get your husband. Uh, I have no husband. Jesus is right. You don't have a husband. You've had five, and the guy you're with now is not your husband. That sounds like truth. Jesus speaks truth to the woman caught in adultery. Neither do I condemn you. Go your way. Sin no more. But truth in every case. So depending on where my particular struggle would be, I'm going to look for that element. I'm going to look for that situation where Jesus shows me how to speak truth where I need to learn it. And then the next is I've got to, when I look at that, I need to look at that and understand that what I'm seeing, when I see Jesus speak to the Pharisees or speak to the woman at the well or, or speak to Nicodemus in John 3 or speak to, when I see that in Jesus, I am looking into the mirror of, at the character that now resides in me. Because his spirit resides in you. That's right. That is an accurate picture of the character that dwells in me through the Spirit of Christ. And that changes our mindset from one of defeat to one that says, I can like this because of his Spirit in me, and that is his character. Jesus has already overcome all of the temptations that are common to man in his skin. Why can't his Spirit do that in my skin? See, this is a a totally different approach to change. This is not a human approach to change. This is, this is doing my part to be diligent to put that picture of God's character in front of my eyeballs and then allowing God's spirit in me to affect the change of character. People, I tell them this and they don't, they don't believe me. They, I say, hey, listen, you know, if, if you do this, if you will focus on this, you, it'll change you and your old habits will just kind of fall away and you won't recognize when they left. Sometimes they say it out loud. Most of the time I just know they're thinking it. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. sure. That's not going to happen. Not my habit. You know, it does though. Because when we focus on doing things the way Christ does them, when we focus on that's my character, I'm an honest man, I'm a truthful man, because Christ in me is truthful, we will find ourselves accidentally telling the truth. When we focus on I'm a, I'm a moral man. I love people for their souls. We will find ourselves accidentally being concerned about the souls of the people around us. And you can just fill in the blank. That's the only, only mechanism that the scripture recognizes to change the inner man is what he calls renewing the mind. So we're not going to, we don't want to be transformed or conformed to this world, but we want to be transformed rather Romans 12, in the 1 and 2, we want to be transformed by the renewing of the mind. 
we will be transformed so that we may prove what is that good and perfect will of God. And that's the only way to get it done. That really can't be overstated. No. We take episodes one through this one and, and put it all together. This concept is really revolutionary compared to what most of us hear. Yeah, it's huge. And, and it's, um, if we stop to think about it for just a minute, it's 180 degrees opposite of the normal prescription given for overcoming sin. Yeah. <clears throat> what if in trying to look at and identify what's missing, a person feels like, I don't know if I can quite identify it. What if I just go and start reading Jesus, accounts of Jesus doing, just, just go in and start reading the scriptures and looking for character qualities in him? There's got to be some benefit to that. If a person can't identify, well, I think my problem is I lack this. Mm-hmm. He's like, well, I lack this and this, and I, <laughs> I'm lacking patience and gentleness and kindness and love, and where do I start? You, you know, a person can't go wrong by going and reading of Jesus' life and his example even if he's not exactly ser- knowing exactly what he's searching for. I don't think it's necessary. It's not so much that he gets it exactly right, that this is the one character that, boy, if I had this, all these things would go away. What's more important is that he's looking with diligence. So instead of instead of the guy who says, I found the perfect verse that's going to solve my issue, and I'm just going to focus on, it's more important that we're consistent in the looking, that we're consistent renewing the mind day by day, that this is a continual process. So I think the repetition aspect is powerful when it comes to a particular scripture, because if I'm reading through five chapters a night to try and find, you know, what it is I'm lacking, Mm -hmm. frankly, for me, that's too jumbled. And I need to be, personally, I have to be a little bit more focused than that. So I may not get the right one necessarily the first time, but Chances are good that whichever one I choose is going to be beneficial for me. So I would say pick one, stay on that for a couple of weeks, just every night, every morning, however you're going to do it. But daily, and it has to be daily, you've got to be taking your mind back to that place and looking at that principle. If after a couple of weeks, you know, you say, "I, I think I'm going to, I think this other thing might be helpful. Well, by all means, do the other thing. But the trick is not so much that you found the exactly right verse. What is important is that you're looking at the character of Christ and you're doing it continually. Just like Moses looked at the face of God and he came away with that kind of change. And that really does happen. It really does happen. If if you'll try it, if you'll work it, I know you guys, some of you are thinking that right now, like, no, nah, this is, sounds too easy. It really does happen. God can change you. We just have to work with God to allow him to do it. That is exciting. It, that is it, super You just exciting. can't hardly wait to try it out. <laughs> yeah. So go identify the problem, just start identifying it, and, and go for it. It almost makes you excited <laughs> about finding something that we're lacking in. <laughs> but really because of the hope that lies on the other side of that process. It, it might not be fun starting off. Yeah. It, no one likes having to admit a character that we're lacking in. But, but the hope of, of the fact that we can adopt the character of Christ in our life and be lights spiritually the way Moses' face was, it gives us great hope. It, it really does. Now it's not, we're not trying to avoid our shortcomings. Now we're trying to knock them down. All right, men. With that, let's go do it. All right. See you next time. All right.